Hey everybody, I wanted to make a video talking about friendships and um, how to kind of tell like who, what makes somebody a good friend, what makes someone a bad friend, and, and just to kind of talk about friendships in general. And I want to do so by talking about childhood <laughs> crazy stories. I don't know, I think that it's maybe a good way to illustrate what I've like the the point right okay so because I can use examples from that like from personal experience um the first thing I want to say though uh just to do some housekeeping uh if you're new here my name is Christina this is my channel I talk about all kinds of things that I find interesting um so if you haven't subscribed to the channel if you are new I encourage you to do so I hope you do so I hope you join our community here, our family. We really are like a family at this point. We have an awesome community. So for people who are familiar with my story, you'll understand this maybe a little bit better. If you don't know much about my origin story, my backstory, I have videos up um, on the channel somewhere where I have talked about uh, my childhood. So uh, just to make it brief, um, I grew up in an abusive household with a narcissistic alcoholic mother who, I think she also had bipolar, manic depression, stuff like that. Um, and she threw me out of the house when I was 17, stole my identity. She was recently arrested, so there's that. Um, but, so, th that was very formative, though. Um... And I've talked about those experiences. I think a lot of that shaped my life or who I am as a person, these experiences. So I want to talk about that time, right? I've told the story of the night that I was thrown out just to, just to give some background for people who aren't aware. I grew up in South Florida in West Palm Beach and... Um, when I was a teenager, I was working at a high-end seafood restaurant um, by Clematis Street. It was next to E.R. Bradley's uh, downtown West Palm Beach. And um, I was working there as a hostess while I was a teenager. I think probably when I was like maybe 16 and then 17. Um, so at the time I was working there uh, as a hostess, um, there were uh, older people who worked there as wait staff. There was one guy, I don't want to say his name or like call him out or anything like that. I don't want to, I don't like, I don't want to put his identity out there because um, I just don't want to make people uncomfortable. Like I want to protect people's identities. So I work with this one guy. He was in uh, college at the time. And so he was waiting tables and he had this older brother and his older brother was like, a real estate agent and he would bring people to that like the restaurant that I worked at for I think like business deals and stuff like he would like schmooze with people like the whining and dining type thing so anyways that's how I met that guy uh, the brother um, I would sit at the hostess stand and he would come up and like talk to me uh, he introduced himself and said you know I'm so-and-so's brother I bring clients here a lot. I hang out here a lot. Nice to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. So as time went on, he would, he talked to me more and I kind of got to know him. We talked about things like skateboarding and indie music. We actually had like a lot in common, even though he was older than me. I was like 16 or 17 at the time and he was like 29. Um, and so, like, we we watched, like, a lot of the same things, though, too. So, like, we ended up having, like, a lot of stuff in common. And so he would just kind of come in and we would just, like, talk a little bit. And sometimes um, when it was slow, like, towards nighttime, if he was out at the side table in front of the restaurant, I would kind of sit out there and just kind of hang out and chat with him and his, like, business associates or his friends. I could see the front door, like I was right by the front door, so if someone was coming in, I could seat them or whatever, but since I was bored, you know, I would go out there and talk, and anyway, so, um, 
that was how I met him. And uh, one night, I was going home after work. And I was, like, walking to the car in the parking lot. And he, like, walked me to my car. And then he he uh, he did this thing where he got, like, real close to me and, and grabbed my my arm and he took this like pen or sharpie out and he wrote his phone number and he was like oh that's my number now now you have my number you can call me if you ever need to and I was like okay guys I was in high school (laughs) I was a teenager at the time I know like I've talked about this now like as I'm an adult like I've talked to other people and they were like yeah that was totally inappropriate But at the time, I didn't think it was weird and I didn't think it was because, I don't know, I guess I'm, I was mature for my age because I had to, like, be the the parent at that, at my house, you know, I don't know. So I just didn't think it was weird. But now looking back as an adult, I could say maybe it was. I still don't think so, though. I mean, it's not like I was, I was a junior in high school. All right. It's not like I was 14 or something. Anyways, I know some of you guys aren't going to like it, though, and that's okay. Um, Then there were other times, like, there was another incident where, like, my mother was driving me to work and I got, I was getting out to go in and she was yelling at me. She got out of the car, too, and kind of followed me into the restaurant and I think she slapped me in the face. And then I, I was like, she, she was going to storm back out and I was kind of following her to like yell at her, like, like to say like, you need to like go back home or whatever. Like you're embarrassing me. And he came out and like, he like got right in front of her, like stopped her from like, you know, storming into her car. And she's like, who the F are you? (laughs) You know? Because he, he had just, like, got right in front of her, just, like, stood there, like, with a stupid smile on his face. And he was like, my name is, and I'm not going to say his name because I'm just not going to. And then he said, and I'm going to marry your daughter one day. And she was so mad. And then she gets in the car and, like, she drives off in a huff. And then when I got home that night, she asked me, who was that guy? And I was like, um he's like he's the brother of one of the guys I work with and she's like what does he do for a living and I told her he was like a a real estate agent and she's like well does he have money and I was like I don't know I guess and she was like oh then I like him of course like of course that was that's how my mother was so anyways but that was like the level of my interaction with him I did not have a lot of interaction with him we would just talk you know sometimes he didn't come in there every night or anything like that so anyways and I've told the story before so I'm not going to get into this again but when I was 17 and my mother threw me out of the house and threw all my stuff into the street and I had to like sleep on couches and stuff like that first night of being homeless as a teenager it when I got home from work it was late it was like 11 o'clock or midnight and um you know, you're in, we were in high school, so I didn't have any friends that I could call that would even be awake at that time to, like, let me go stay with them, um, and they all lived with their parents, so I didn't have, I had nowhere to go that night, so I had to, um, call the, uh, I, the bartender at the restaurant I worked at, she lived at an apartment across the street from the restaurant. She was a drug dealer also. I don't think I knew that at the time, but the girl who was giving me a ride home that I worked with at the restaurant was like, oh, you should call her the bartender. I don't want to say her name, but you know, she lives by the restaurant. She lives across the street. That way you can walk to get to work the next day. So I was like, okay. So I spent the night, you know, there, I spent a couple nights there. I was sleeping on that woman's couch and I went through a very, very hard time. I was crying. I was having these panic attacks and I would, I couldn't sleep. I had to take sleeping pills because I kept thinking, what is going to happen to me? Where am I going to go? How am I going to get out of this situation? I ended up having to drop out of high school. I didn't have a car. This was before the internet. It's not like you could go make a GoFundMe or you had social media followers. We didn't have social media. We had these old like Nokia phones. So 
even like the f friends that I had, um, that you weren't like in constant contact with people. It was not the way that it is now where you could just find someone to help you. And again, all of my friends were in high school and they had to go to school every day. I didn't. I was now at that point working. So at that time, no one was really able to help me. None of my friends could help me in that way. But also once I, you know, was uh, staying on her couch, I tried to ask my friends if they could come see me or whatever. No one came to see me. And when I would call people, like, no one would take my calls. People hardly talked to, like, my friends hardly responded to my messages, you know. Um, and it's not like I, I hold it against these people. I'm sure, you know, what, what can you do in that situation? I'm sure there wasn't much they could do to help me, but you can still be supportive, right? I had, like, one friend, um, this, this girl who was sort of like my best friend at that time. She was, I think she was like a year or two older than me. She would come down and like take me to like run errands and stuff like that. So I could like buy food or like, you know, I don't know, do, do the things that I needed to do. I had a lot I had to get done there cause I had to go do like the GED thing since I had to drop out of school. So that was like one person that helped me one person none of my other friends would come down to see me or would make any real effort to help me or even like talk to me. Um, so it was very like, it was a lonely thing, uh, to, in to think that like you have all of these friends and then to realize kind of overnight that if you're ever in a bad or vulnerable situation, no one is going to help you. No one's coming to save you, you know, and no one cares. Nobody owes you anything. You're not entitled to anything. And you're at that point, you're in this situation of you're either going to fight to survive or you're going to just die. That was like the situation that I was in. I was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to just like kill myself? Um, or am I going to try to fight to survive? Because your options your world seems very small at that point when each day is a struggle just to live. You're not thinking like long term. You're thinking, how do I get through this day? <laughs> and then the next one. That is it. That's as much thinking as you're doing or like planning or anything like that. So anyways, um, to kind of bring it back to the, the topic at hand though that's when you realize like and that's when you learn who the good friends are who your real friends are who actually cared about you who was willing to you know put themselves out there for you who was willing to take the time to talk to you or to come see you who was willing to make a sacrifice for you or, or whatever to help you um and it's very few people and uh anyways so, to continue the story here, um, the restaurant that I was working at as a hostess allowed me to uh, very quickly go through server training and get on the floor as a waitress, and they would let me work doubles and stuff so I could start making real money um, and try to get on my feet and stuff. And so, um, I was still staying, you know, I was still sleeping on the bartender's couch at that point and kind of like living out of this little suitcase and it was an awful situation. But the older brother of the guy I worked with, you know, that I had interacted with before that I told you guys about that I knew as a friend and I had his phone number and stuff, he came up to me when I was working one night and said, I heard what happened to you. My brother told me that your your mom threw you out. I heard that you had to drop out of school. I heard that you are sleeping on so-and-so's couch. He, I think he knew that she was a drug dealer too. So he said to me, like, you're, you're not going to stay with her anymore. You are going to come stay with me. You're going to come to my apartment, like, after work, after your shift is over. 
I'm going to take you to get your things and you're going to come stay with me. And so, um, I didn't really, like, I didn't, I wasn't in a position to really say no. I, he lived in a nicer place and, um, he wasn't a drug dealer. <laughs> He wasn't a drug dealer and I felt like I was imposing on her anyways. It wasn't like she had told me I could stay with her long term. I had been sleeping on her couch and probably like wearing out my welcome. So anyways, um, I remember that night though, that first night, he, uh, we got my things. I had just this little suitcase on wheels. That was all the things I had in my possession. And, um, he lived over at the courtyards of City Place, which is a nice, um, community. He had a nice, like, a uh, fourth floor apartment corner window overlooking, like, the courtyard there. And it had a pool and, you know, all of this nice stuff. It was very nice. And it had a gated community. Like, it had, like, these gates. You had to have a key code to get in, which I was, like, oh, so grateful for, you know. Um, because it made me feel safer. But I remember that first night getting there, you know, he, he was a guy, single guy. So he lived in a, like a one bedroom apartment by himself, uh, whatever. So he was like, oh yeah, you can sleep in my room and I'll sleep out on the couch and like, don't worry about anything. I know that you're really like stressed out and I know you're in a really bad situation and I want to help you. And, like, he hardly knew me. He did not really know me at that point. It's just from the conversations we had, like, at work. And maybe things his brother told him about me. So, I, like, I felt really weird and um, kind of uncomfortable about the whole thing. But, like, whatever. What are you going to do? So, I was, like, sleeping in his bed. And then I, like, came out. Cause he was sleeping on the couch and I just like lay down next to him and he like put his arm around me and it wasn't anything weird. Like all he said was like, I know that you're, I know you're worried and you're going to be okay. And I'm going to take care of you. That was it. And I just felt really safe. Like for the first time since that whole thing happened, since I had been thrown out onto the street and I was having these like daily fucking panic attacks and having to take sleeping pills that night that was the first night I was able to sleep without having to like knock myself out so I was very grateful for that and yes I was 17 he was 29 you know whatever I was out on my own at that point I was for all intents and purposes an adult I had dropped out of high school and um I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Some people will think it was inappropriate. I can't really say. I I didn't think so at the time. I didn't really understand. I don't know if I understood, like, that it would be, um, or that it could be or something. As an adult, I still don't really know what the answer there is. Like, if that was or wasn't. All I know, though, is that that saved my life and that I continued to have a relationship with him for like three years uh, after that. He, um, he did take care of me. I wanted to go out on my own. Like I didn't want to just rely on him. He let me take six months off of work so I could just kind of like relax and I helped him with his real estate stuff. And then I got back into working and doing my own thing. But that really did help me. And, um, you know, that relationship lasted a while. And we went through a lot together. He ended up moving to New York. So after the... Because this was in 2007 when I was thrown out. 2008 and 9 and 10 was the, like, economic crash, right? The real estate market in Florida went, so he moved to New York to establish himself doing Manhattan real estate. So he threw me out, he flew me out there like three times. Um, I wanted to be with him. <laughs> 
I loved him very much. I, I even knew back then I was young and stupid and naive, but I had the self-awareness to know that, like, this person probably saved my life and, like, really did help me and that really bad things could have happened to me. But anyways, um, he told me that I had to be... I had to be with someone my own age. I had to go be with someone my own age so that I could get married and have kids and have a life that he couldn't give me. And he said that as I got older, I would grow to resent him. And he was the first person in my life that, like, believed in me, man. When I was 17 and I went through all of that, like being homeless, getting thrown out, having to drop out of high school, I kept saying like, I'm going to be a loser forever or that's what I was thinking. Or I looked at my mother, the narcissistic alcoholic loser, and I thought I'm going to end up like them. That because of my situation and my parents and how my parents are, I'm never going to be... I, I'm never going to rise above that level, right? I'm going to be a loser forever like them. And I thought that because I dropped out of high school, that would, like, ensure that. And he was, like, he told me when I was 17, you're smart. You have character. You're talented. You could do anything you want. There's nothing holding you back except your mental, you know, uh, issues like you put these like limitations on yourself and if you can get past that like there's nothing that will stop you you can go as far as you want you can be as successful as you want you know you're there's something special about you like I didn't see any of that in myself he was the first person though that ever said anything like that to me and like made me believe that I could do those things if I tried. And he said that there were a lot of successful people he knew who had created businesses and stuff that didn't have college degrees, that weren't educated people, but were smart, you know, in other ways, whatever. He was the first person, though, that kind of taught me these, that told me these things and then kind of taught me how to, how to survive how to take care of myself, how to put myself out there, how to try to get jobs, you know, um, <laughs> and how to, how to talk to people, how to, like, network with people. That was a big part of his job. Um, so the point is, though, there was a time, though, that, like, at that point, like, he was this very attractive, very handsome man. He was young, like 29, then 30 and 31, and he had a lot of money. He made a lot of money. Um, and there were a lot of women his age that were maybe prettier than me, that were more educated, that I thought had more to offer, that dressed nicer or whatever. And he wasn't interested in them. Like, I think he'd been around those girls for a very long time and they would constantly throw themselves at him. And uh, I think he thought they only were interested in him uh, for his money. And um, it was the weirdest thing, though. I was like, what, is, what does this person see in me when they have all these other options or whatever? And he never made me feel like I was, like, a loser or that I was, like, less than anybody, you know, because of my circumstances or lack of education or whatever. And then he would introduce me to people that were, you know, wealthy, successful, people he was working with. Like, he wasn't ashamed of me. He wasn't ashamed to introduce me to people and to create you know I don't know help me make friends with people that could help me later on and uh no one had done that for me literally nobody in my life had done that for me before and nobody did that for me when I was out on my own like that that was like the one person that was a I think a true friend to me and really tried to show me how to survive on my own as a young person and um anyways yeah, so it 
that's when you f have people like that when you find if you have a friend like that that is so important if you have friends that are willing to help you make sacrifices for you when you are at like the bottom when you're at your lowest and they still see potential in you and they see something in you that you don't even see in yourself and they support you and build you up instead of tearing you down that is a real friend i think we all have had friends friends or whatever people that you think were your friends right that you invest your time energy money whatever into that you try to help repeatedly and then one day they stab you in the back they betray you or they just kind of end the friendship they just stop talking to you and you're not really sure why that is going to be most people i mean i learned back then that most people don't care about you, that you are totally on your own. Um, and I learned that most friends are fair weather friends. They're fickle. They're, they'll be your friend as long as you have something to offer them and, and it's convenient. If it's difficult, if it's hard to be your friend, very few people are willing to still stand by you. So I think that you have to be aware of this and be careful of who you allow into your inner circle, shall we say. Who do you allow to get close to you to be your friend? Make sure that it's not a person that is going to just abandon you or break your trust or something. And I am of the opinion, because of these experiences, that trust is not something you just give to people. You give respect to people without them having to earn it. Be respectful to everybody, no matter what. Um, but trust has to be earned. You do not freely just give trust out to random people. You make people earn your trust. And I think we've all had people that gossip, um, sp spread rumors about you, or people that get jealous for whatever reason and try to destroy your friendships with other people or maybe your reputation or maybe they don't respect your boundaries or they're the kind of person that they only call you when they need something or they only call you to talk about themselves and never ask you how you're doing, what you have going on in your life. It's very one-sided, superficial, <laughs> um, things like that. Yeah. These are the people that you don't want in your life. The people that are always like taking, taking, taking from you, but they're never giving. So it's not reciprocal. It's not a um, a win-win situation. It's like one-sided and one person is doing more of the work. One person cares more than the other. One person is initiating contact. You know, how many of these especially with online communities. And Nick Ricada has talked about the toxicity of online communities. How many of your online friends, if you don't reach out to them, they will just stop talking to you, you know? Like, they're not your real friends unless you've tried to um, take steps to build, like, a, the foundation of a real relationship and you're going to try to meet in real life or something. Um, then they're... They're just acquaintances, you know, and these people come and go and whatever in the, in the slightest thing could, could set them off, you know, a, a perceived, uh, slight could make someone turn on you like that. So I'm very weary of people nowadays. Um, I have the Christian mindset too, of, um, the fact that we are, as humans, we're all fallen, we're, we all tend towards sin and stuff like that. So that's how I tend to look at things and, and the way that I see it is man is fallen. And so I don't, I'm not surprised by, you know, sinful behavior or whatever, people, when people don't always do the right thing. So I would just tell people and caution them, be very weary of people who exhibit the signs that we talked about. And also, if you have someone in your life that is a true friend, make sure that you are grateful for that and that you cherish them and that you don't take them for granted. Uh, that's the end of my story time and my little rant here and my 
lesson on friendship, talking about friendships. If you enjoyed the video, uh, like the video. Um, if you have anything to say about it, leave a comment in the comment section and subscribe if you haven't already. What do you've got to lose? <laughs> Free!